you could cast your mind back and think about prior to shooting, how did you sort of first hear the project, get involved, and um, yeah, play play this amazing character? Right. Um, yeah, the, the way the, pro the project came, honestly, the way most projects come, you get a ring ring, it's the manager, you got this thing, it's called Emperor, it's about this guy, Shields Green, I said, who? <laughs> And uh, yeah, he was like this guy who fought in this uh, raid on Harper's Ferry, you know, in the 18, in the what, in the where. And um, and honestly speaking, like when, when it came to me, I was like, I, I have no interest in, in playing the story. You know, I don't really want to do the slave narrative. Um, you know, I just feel like, you know, black people or, you know, African-Americans, we're just in this place where we're trying to see new images of ourselves on the screen. And, and honestly, in retrospect, an extremely ignorant stance. Because by saying that, you're saying that somebody who lived and walked this earth, I'm sorry, your story is not valid. Like your story is not worth telling. And um, and so I was challenged, you know, my manager was like, you know, just give it, just look at it. Let's look at the material, Google the guy. I think he's really interesting, which I did. And to find out what he did and, and you know, his story. And obviously there's very little about the individual himself, but, you know, the, the culminating um, event of his life was this raid on Harper's Ferry with John Brown and his brothers and these abolitionists. And I'm like, why don't I know about this? And then you hear, you know, Harriet Tubman talk about him and you hear Frederick Douglass write about him in his autobiography. This guy, not to be flippant, but he's almost like this Forrest Gumpian figure. Like, how does he, how is he rubbing shoulders with all these people through history? You know, John Brown, Levi Coffin, like, you know, so that got me interested as to who he was and, and his age and, you know, ha, you know, he, being this guy who fought back against the slave masters and freed himself from South Carolina, which was notorious for being very, having an, an incredible uh, rate at catching runaway slaves. So for him to escape was, was beyond a miracle. And then having this nickname of emperor where did, no one really knows where it came from. Was it, you know, tied to his history from Africa or was it just something about himself and the way he carried himself, you know? So all those things were just such a recipe where I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is, this is a, a Civil War era picture I haven't seen or a character I haven't seen. Um, and I started to really get interested in playing the role. So then I just, you know, you mount a campaign and you begin auditioning and audition, audition, sending the tapes and, um, eventually went to LA and read with Mark Ammon and, uh, and Reggie Hudlin, our producer, as well as Cami Winnikoff. And, um, they were crazy enough to, to give me the role. So, um, the rest is history, but yeah. It's interesting you bring up Harriet Tubman. And, um, I remember I was in Toronto actually, uh, I think it was the year before last, didn't go last year, obviously, but, um, she obviously is British and she's you know born in England. Yeah, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so she Cynthia Riva, yeah, and she's and I said to her, you know, I feel embarrassed because I don't know too much about this character because you know, mm -hmm. in this figure of history, because we get taught over here obviously about you know the, the events and certain events, but you know, very, very sporadically, you know, and, and not specifically on one event. So um I had no idea if she was green or anything like that before. But that's the great thing about these kind of films, because afterwards I was then able to to go into it so yeah how much detail did you go into i mean you touched upon it a second ago in, in certain terms of research and there can't be a lot about him you know uh out there so was it history books or was it just literally the internet and, and right. yeah. well it, it, it all starts with mark ammon and and the type of movie he wanted to make mark did not want to make it make a history film yes he wanted people to watch the film and he wanted people to go do research on their own but mark wanted to make he wanted to make a fairy tale you know he wanted to he wanted to do a bit of revisionist history along like the quentin tarantino route where you want to capture the spirit of the character but you want your character to win at the end you know almost like what quentin did with once upon a Marath once upon a time in uh, hollywood and you know sharon tate yes. uh surviving so he wanted to do something like that but that requires you trying your best to be as truthful to the characters as possible, the spirit of the individuals. So we started from there knowing what the type of movie I was making, but you know, I, I, I'm a nerd about what I do. I love acting, I really do. And I'm, I am, a, I obsess about everything. So did I read everything there is out there to read about Shields Green? I absolutely did. I read court documents, I read um, newspaper articles from that era and how people talked about him you know, how they wrote about his demeanor in court and, you know, um, as well as doing research on what the day-to-day -day life of an enslaved people were. What did they eat? What was their diet? You know, um, 
what was their sense of self, you know? And then you start to find all these little discoveries that um, you find out you've created a lot of images in your head as to how slaves lived back then that really are just that, they're images you've just conjured up in your head that have no base in reality. And you find out that, you know, just like the saying goes, desperation is the mother of invention. And so because of that, slaves were very cerebral people. They lived a, 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 a hugely complex life within their minds. And so it started becoming a mind experiment with me. And then that led me down another rabbit hole of studying trauma and what happens to you know, children of trauma and how, how does trauma manifest physically, you know, in, in ways that live with people their whole lives, you know, uh, Mark and I had this whole thing of within the first 30 minutes of the film, Shields shouldn't maintain a lot of eye contact with anybody, uh, which is a common trait of children who've gone through child abuse. You know, he should, you know, he, you know, he just doesn't have the confidence to maintain eye contact. And, um, and also with his speech in Frederick Douglass's book, Frederick wrote about Shields and said he spoke in a very deliberate, poignant, but broken up pattern. And, in a weird way, I, I remember I, what, I went, I was like, oh, I'm going to watch the King's speech and kind of see, you know, because stuttering is something that is very associated also with trauma at a very, very early age. And yeah. to reverse engineer that and say, how does somebody overcome a speech impediment? And then what does that sound like? Yeah. So Shields and the way he spoke and how his pattern was really him trying to fight off stuttering, which the audience would never know about. But this is just little things that that just help you embody the character and help you carry that trauma. And so you're always aware of it with, with literally every word that he speaks. And, and to not play courage, but to play fear. You know, fear is, fear is not, the, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is fear, but choosing to do it anyway. And so I was very adamant with Mark, this guy shouldn't feel like a superhero. I know we're trying to tell a Western, you know, the Civil War era and the Western happened at the same time, which people always forget, you know, it's almost like America's two different denials of history. You know, you've got one side of, oh, it's the, the, you know, the 1800s were the great West and we conquered and pioneered and no, you were also enslaving people. So it's like these two things were happening at the same time. But um but yeah, you know, I, I was very adamant. Yes, it, it can live in that world, but I don't want him to be a hero. You know, I want us to always be aware of the vulnerability of this man and, and the, the, the superpower, his superpower is how he feels fear, but decides to go anyway. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting tension. And on, on, on screen, it, it plays in a very, it's a very attracting thing to watch on camera, you know, um, and so, yeah, these are all just minor things that details that we watched. And, you know, even down to the issue of him, we had a huge conversations with the producers, like with Shields, when Shields' wife, Sarah dies, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> he, he, he takes a bracelet that he had given her off of his wrist. And we were like, would slaves have jewelry? Like they wouldn't have money to make, to, to buy jewelry. Where would jewelry? They made the jewelry. That's where it came from. They made it. It was something he had to make mm -hmm. for her. So it was just those little details that, you know, we would, we would do. And with hair and makeup, you know, what kind of, what did they do to moisturize their skin? They used pig fat, you know, can we use real pig fat? And no, we can't screen actors guild. <laughs> so, you know, you know, you, you always find, try and see where you can push it and try to be as authentic as possible. And yeah, I definitely had to lose weight. There's a lot of running in the movie. I mean, Shields is running from page one to page 100 and it's just running, running, running. Say that. So in, yeah, got to get the cardio up. Yeah, you're in every scene, so it must have been just physically trying to get into. I mean, I, I, you know, you're probably in good shape anyway, but you know, just getting ready for that. I think it was a 28 day shoot. Is that right? It was quite a tight. Yes, very very quick shoot. But yeah, I did. I lost about 30 pounds to play this film. I usually carry myself at around 185, and Mark and I we decided we didn't want him to be, you know, Luke Cage or Superman. He's he's what's again. It goes back to the research. What's the slave's diet? What's their workload? And what would that do to the body? They would be gaunt. They would be. They would be very stringy. And so we, we came along the idea we want him to have a soccer player's body. Oh, I'm sorry, the uh, football player's body. <laughs> yeah, a footy, a footy, a football player's body. So, so yeah, and and that was like okay, we got to get the calories down and we got to get down to shape. And so a lot of cardio. And then I'd never ridden a horse. Got to learn how to ride a horse. I was in Jersey taking horse lessons um, to learn how to ride. And and yeah, so a lot. This is without a doubt the most involved I've ever 
been in preparing to play a character, mentally or physically. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's about that work with Mark. Mark is obviously his first film with a director. He's got mm-hmm. decades worth of experience in terms of producing. He's worked on yeah. some big films. And also you've got Red, Reginald Hudlin, who's obviously a director himself. Uh, you know, I, I remember him from House Party, which must yep. be long, 93, something like that, you know? So yeah, classic. <laughs> got this vast knowledge. I mean, what were those two like to work with? Because you've got a debut director, but someone that also knows the business, and you've got another director who isn't directing but he's your producer it was it was just that it was just that and listen mark is mark is one of the most egoless people you'll ever meet so you know mark was like listen reggie if you feel a piece of direction that you want to give go ahead and give it you know even cammy winnicott or other producer you know it was such a collaborative process everybody just wanted to try and make the best thing possible Mm -hmm. you know we didn't have the big you know um safety net of a studio to to go on and shoot forever and ever and ever and endless money. So, you know, every minute counted, every second counted, you know, with these independent films, but but the heart was there, you know, in the hair department, makeup department, wardrobe department, even our cinematographer, Jeremy Rouse, who I just think is, he's pound for pound up there with the rest of them, with Roger Deakins and them. I think he's a tremendous cinematographer. I think the movie looks incredible. And so, yeah, they just, you know, they just really wanted to make the best thing possible. And those guys, Re- Reggie was on set every single day, every single day. There are a lot of producers who are not like that. He was there every day watching every take and just always making sure that we had our finger on the pulse of something that felt somewhat authentic, even though we were making a very pulpy film. You know, we got wagon chases and a lot of crazy things happening and gunfights. But, you know, when we hit those emotional beats, um, we, we want to have truly cathartic experiences put up there on, on screen. Sure. Yeah. Said, they're great they're great people love them all and it comes across in the film actually and you know i wasn't aware that i mean obviously i did the reading on on shields afterwards um which is yeah. the reverse of what you guys did but his fate is very different uh, yeah you know, to, uh, you've touched upon that i mean you said that that was one of the first things that attracted you to it um mm. But, you know, kind of, it was, for me, I mean, it took a while to get the sort of the tone of the film. And once I've got it, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, in, I'm into this. And it's, and it's fantastic. So, you know, it's kind of, how would you describe the film to an audience? Um, you said to the Tarantino connection. So I'm guessing yeah. you, you like those kind of films. You're, you're a big this, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, Emperor is first and foremost a, a fairy tale about a real man who lived, you know? And it's it's almost like, at night when you're putting your kids to sleep and you tell your kid about Martin Luther King and you're like, he, you know, son, it was like he came down from heaven on, on wings, you know what I'm saying? And then when you make the movie, you literally show him coming down from heaven on wings. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely revisionist history, but it's, it, it sparks the imagination so people can go out there and do the research for themselves and see what actually happened and see, you know, that the raid on Harper's Ferry that Shields Green and John Brown participated in was, you know, a lot of people, Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, you know, spoke about it as being the spark, one of the major sparks that lit the fuse for the Civil War. And without the Civil War, we don't have the Emancipation Proclamation, and you don't have the Reconstruction Era, and then you eventually don't have Black people eventually getting the 13th Amendment and, you know, equality in America, citizenship, you know what I mean? Prior to that, a Black person in America was considered three-fourths of a person. So a lot of people had to sacrifice a lot for me to even be in this movie and to be talking to you right now. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we want to do. That's ultimately what the movie is about. You know what I mean? And that's the movie we wanted, we wanted to make. It's a, it's a, it's a movie about a real person, you know, first and foremost, and it's a, it's a hero's journey. It's a human story. And it's, it's just to, Rather than just incite violence or incite hatred, we really wanted it to be a movie that that incited empathy and and caused people to come together and 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 read about these people. This is in an era where where, like I said, a, a black person wasn't even considered human. But even in that era, John Brown, his brothers, and so he's his sons, and Dangerfield Newby and Shields Green came together to try and accomplish something, right? Even, the odds of that happening in that time were impossible, you know? So it is one of the earliest 
stories in America of black people and white people coming together to try and accomplish something. Do you know what I'm saying? So it truly is a story of collaboration. Ultimately, it didn't work out in real life, obviously, but it is one of America's earliest recordings of a true kind of collaboration, you know? And, um, and I, I, well, the ending is it's really, really uplifting in terms of you right. it when you walk away, you know, it's like, wow, that was, you go and see something like, you know, 12 Years a Slave off the top of Yeah, you're just depressed for weeks after. <laughs> exactly, so, which was quite a nice surprise uh, from, from a viewer's point of view. And I think that needs to be put across. Yeah, and then we do, and we want people to have fun. We want you to have fun in the in the in the in the cinema. You know, we we want you to we want you to, you know, to to indulge in the mythology of Shields Emperor Green. You know, because film is entertainment at the at the end of the day, and it is make believe and, and all those things. But you know, if you can have a little bit of a cathartic experience while you're watching it, that's great. Yeah, that's very very great as well. Yeah. Cool. And obviously, this is a big indie big indie production. Indie production. You've worked on some very different types of films in the past yeah. and some Hunger Games and, and Terminator. Yeah. I mean, kind of an obvious question, but what what the biggest difference between something like that and, and something like this? What what to, to the viewer, how can you explain what the process is like has been like? You've kind of touched on it with the more collaborative type process of people working closer together and working for this personal project. But yeah, what what is the difference between far the money between these huge right. something like, like this? Yeah. The biggest difference, your paycheck and the catering department. <laughs> yes, Hunger Games. Yeah. The irony on the Hunger Games is our catering was spectacular. <laughs> I'm telling you, we were eating veal today and sushi tomorrow and, you know, Chinese food and then Italian food. Like, we were the most fed hungry people on the set of that movie. <laughs> but that's, that's you know, that's big studio films, you know what I mean? And, and you know, there's also a mandate with a studio film. You have that release date. You got to make that release date. And um, and with, with, with an independent movie, you know, nothing is really guaranteed. And even with Hunger Games or Terminator, there's a built-in audience. You know, there's a back-end audience to those things, whether it's from the book or, you know, people who are nostalgic, who, who, have, who are nostalgic about James Cameron's movies. That came out before that and so there's almost a you almost there's a cushion that people are going to see this film yeah. emperor who knows who knows who's going to see it you know but eventually when universal bought it you get excited about that and we, we were going to open in theaters but sadly covid happened um but it's so funny i feel like with everybody at home the movie really got discovered with people just being at home and especially yeah. in 2020 when it came out in america during um uh, the civil unrest we were currently going through at that time um it, the, the numbers were crazy so um yeah uh that's that's just the biggest difference but in terms of process it really doesn't change honestly whether you're shooting a movie or doing television or shooting a commercial or whatever the case may be you know it's it's it comes down to being about people you know mm -hmm. who's my character what does he want what's in his way you know and what's the baggage that he's bringing into the circumstances that he currently finds himself in that's it every single time whether you're playing shields green or whether you're playing you know whoever it's yeah. always the same it's the same formula and um you know I, I heard will smith say this one time you know out of the specific will come the universal so if you have a character and you just be as specific as possible to that character and tell it truthfully out of that you, you know it just it, it just creates a universal monster and anybody who watches it completely can relate to it because it's true yeah. you know the emotions in it are true so yeah you touched upon it very briefly i mean we're locked down here in the uk at the moment we can't leave the house mm. except for exercise or uh, going Yikes. um and you know as you said these kind of films um are being released at a time when there aren't the big blockbusters coming out yeah so, you know and you know people are choosing to watch smaller films so i i see it as a big positive for these smaller, let's face it, sometimes in this case, very much so better films, um, you know, and I'm seeking them out. So, I mean, the film was released this week over here. So I think it will find its find its audience. So um, it's a very positive thing. What do you think about the industry in general? I mean, your, your thoughts on, on, you know, the, the, the theatrical experience and mm -hmm. potentially changing? Man, I am a religious, I, the, the theatrical experience is, is religion to me. You know, what I mean, it, it almost it almost is. You know, I'm a Christian, but it almost is. And 
I love going to the theater. I do. I think the communal experience, there's something unbeaten about it. When you go into that room and the lights go down and the screen opens, you are transported. You are literally transported. And I love it and I advocate for it and I want it to come back. And I don't think it'll ever completely die. If anything, I want to hold the feet to the flame of theater owners and people who run theaters. And I think they've, I think they prior to the pandemic, they took their foot off the gas and they were kind of lackadaisical about their experience. And whether it's them not, you know, being serious about, you know, um, um, having consequences for people who violate the, the theater going experience, whether it's people talking or being on their phone, you know, things like that, or just, you know, just eating like animals, you know, whatever the case may be in the movie theater experience. I think coming back after the pandemic, they'll be forced to look into all those things because I think that's really what's gonna hold people from going back. It's not really the pandemic, but it's like, hmm, do I really want to risk going into a movie theater? Because I'm going to get there. Somebody's going to be on their phone or talking, you know, or walking in and out of the movie theater. Like, so they're going to have to really focus on curating the perfect theater experience. And I think I think that's a good thing, you know, but I don't think it's ever going to go away. Cinema is supposed to be shared, yeah. I think, you know, nothing not to, you know, to, to, to poo poo on the streaming experience. I, I've had a lot of great experiences watching things from the comfort of my home. You know, Breaking Bad was an out of body experience, but the theater is just really something special. And, and you know, even if it becomes a relic of the past and just a special thing, a, a very niche thing a few people do, um, I think it'll live on. I think there's really almost nothing comparable to the theater going experience. People got to go out. Yeah. I was, and, and I'll, I'll presume you're on, uh, on working on something at the moment. So, I mean, I I've been on a, a set back in September in the UK, very small, low budget film. COVID obviously was center of attention all the time. I just wonder what it's like working on, on something at the moment. I mean, what, what, what the experience is like. Is it generally good uh, or is it completely different and you kind of you work in a different way? I mean, how, how is it? No, not not for me. I've I've right so post pandemic, I've been on three sets, uh, three different sets, and no process is still very much the same. The only difference is everybody's wearing masks and face shields, right. but it's still the same process. Um, and um, and yeah, and and luckily the sets that I've been on, you know, we we didn't have anybody, we didn't have cases of people not adhering to protocol which some sets have had that, but we, we didn't have it on our set at all. Um, I mean, the, the, the only real issues are very minor things like, oh, when actors wear masks, now we've got like indentations <laughs> on our faces and or it smears your makeup. So we have this running joke that all the movies that are gonna come out in 2021, just look out for continuity with actors with like <laughs> indentations on their cheeks because of wearing masks, you know, because you have to take off your mask right before you shoot and things like that. But but other than that, no, you know, we haven't really experienced anything like that. I mean, yeah, there's maybe a little bit of just missing that camaraderie off of set. Because you're on a pilgrimage with a bunch of people that have shipped off and left their families to go to wherever, Toronto, Atlanta, wherever it is you find yourself. And you really bond with your castmates on the weekends, you know, when you're not filming. And, you know, and that's the part that's lost from it, you know, is, is the, the camaraderie you form with cast and crew off the set or, you know, in between takes. But now you really can't chit chat too much and you got to be six feet away. And, you know, it, it, the, it misses that. There's an alchemy that happens there that I think is missing. But I think people, we love filmmaking so much that we'll still do it anyway and, and try our best to make, make it feel warm and make it feel pre-COVID on screen at least yeah what's the emperor out this week what do we see you in next what's the next big thing we we get to see you in man next? it's it's so funny so out of the three projects that i'm filming right now i can only talk about one i literally had to talk to my i knew that would be the answer <laughs> yeah um i i did I, I did this movie end of last year called queen pins um such a great movie uh with vince vaughn and Kristen bell and uh and yeah and um paul hauser and it's, it's so amazing. It's based off a real story about these two women that started a, a fraudulent coupon business in Arizona. It's just one of these, it, it's one of these only in America stories and made like a billion dollars selling fake coupons. And then the FBI caught onto the scam and, and um, it's, it's really, really brilliant, but it's, 
it's taken, it's treated very seriously, but it has a little hint of black comedy to it. Very Coen Brothers sensibility uh, slash, you know, Greg Gillespie's I, Tanya type of a feel to it. And um, so that's really interesting. I, I was very excited to do that picture last year. And then I have another movie that I shot earlier this year. That I can't talk about. I'm on a project right now in Toronto. Can't talk about. And I literally leave here to go to Greece to shoot another movie uh, wow. in May that I can't talk about. So I'll have to just come back on your show again later yeah. and talk about all these projects. Because yeah. you're going to Greece more than anything else. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, I've, I, one, I've never been. So I've, I've always wanted to go. And so when, when I got this part, I was excited beyond belief. So yeah, it's a fun one. Really, really fun project. Well, well hopefully everything's back to normal. Uh, there's the light at the end of the tunnel, I can I can see. Certainly over here, we're lucky we're off to a smaller island, but you know, yeah. hopefully it'll all, all improve in the, in the future. But, you know, best of luck with Emperor. It deserves to be seen, and I'm, I'm glad I saw it. So thanks. Thank you, sir.